think Tiger's shaking in his brand new shoes out there and not because he's cold. It's going to be awfully exciting for that young man. Ordonez 0 for 2 in his career against Houston Street. Baseball is America's oldest sport. The first recorded baseball game was in 1846. So think about it for a second. What's truly unique? What has only ever happened in baseball history once? The unassisted triple play has happened 15 times. To end the game, it has happened twice. The immaculate inning has happened 105 times. A game ending obstruction call has happened twice. Pat Van Ditty was ambidextrous, meaning he could pitch with both his left and right hand. But even then, a handful of other pitchers have been recorded to do it. But they aren't who we're here for. Not a physical anomaly. Our guy was just in the right place at the right time. Or as you may see later, the wrong time. Meet Mark Tiger. He was born on May 30th, 1980 in San Diego. In high school, he was a solid hitter, batting 410 with 17 RBIs and going 19 of 19 in stolen bases. That was good enough for him to be drafted in the 1999 MLB draft by the Boston Red Sox. However, he didn't sign. How likely would a player sign with the team that drafts him if it's in the later rounds? It, it depends on whether they've committed to, uh, to go to university somewhere. Uh, sometimes you'll see teams take a long shot on it. I remember a few years ago, I'm a big Yankees fan, and the Yankees uh, drafted Al Leiter's son uh, out, of, out of high school. Um, but he had committed to go to university, might've been Vanderbilt. I don't remember off the top of my head. And I think the Yankees knew he wasn't going to sign, but it was one of those, you take the shot and maybe, maybe he changes his mind and, and decides to, to forgo that university commitment. Uh, I think that was the same round. They drafted one of his high school teammates in the first round, um, Anthony Volt, who just had a, a breakout season and, I think Baseball America might have him, might have him. I think as the as the tenth best prospect in all of baseball. So, you know, he gets drafted in the first round and signs. Lighter gets drafted later, uh, goes to university, re-enters the draft, and I believe it was just this last draft that the Texas Rangers took him uh, in the first round. So, you know, he got a college education and and made considerably more money uh, as a first round pick than he would have if he had signed with the Yankees um, out of high school. In between the end of the high school baseball season and the college baseball season, Mark played in the Western Amateur Baseball Association as a member of the San Diego Stars. The team finished 19-1, becoming Western Baseball Champions and making the National Baseball Congress World Series, where they would come in third. Mark would spend 1999 at Grossmont Junior College near his hometown putting up incredible offensive stats, batting 497 and having a 44-game hit streak. He led all California junior colleges in seven different offensive categories, and he parlayed that success into transferring to Division I Florida. Mark's time with the Gators went well. He emerged as the starter at second base and was the leadoff hitter for the majority of his time there. By the end of his college career with the Gators, he had become fifth all-time on their run-scored leaderboard. But as he entered the 2002 MLB Draft, unbeknownst to him, he was about to become a part of history. To truly understand the significance of being drafted by the Oakland Athletics in 2002, we must go back to 2001. The Oakland A's lost the 2001 ALDS after blowing a 2-0 series lead to the New York Yankees. The loss was hard, but compounding that was the loss of stars Johnny Damon, Jason Giambi, and Jason Isringhausen. However, Billy Bean pulled off some brilliant moves, and the A's went on a 20-game winning streak to miraculously win the AL West. But how did they do it? Moneyball. I don't quite understand it. I know okay. it's looking at analytics and finding that. Yeah, I mean, analytics is part of it. So, you know, for a long time, the 
and I mean a long time, like decades and decades, uh, baseball scouting was, you know, you send almost always an ex-player who now works for you as a scout. They go out on the road and they watch minor league games. And, you know, if guys pass the eye test, um, you know, maybe you're, you're looking at their velocity, things like that. But that was the, the, the modus operandi for a long time. Moneyball is is definitely analytics, but it's also you're looking for you're looking for ways to maximize efficiency. So think about the the batting average statistic. Uh, you know, if a guy hits 300, you're like, oh, awesome. But one of the stats, and I you know I'm old enough to remember, I was aware of on base percentage, but nobody really cared about it for a long time. I shouldn't say nobody cared about it. We didn't pay it as as, as much attention as perhaps we should have for a long time. But you think about it. If a guy hits 300 uh, but doesn't take very many walks, you know, ends up with a 340, 350 on base percentage, well, you got a guy who maybe hits 260 or 270 but has a great eye at the plate, walks 100 times, on base percentage ends up, you know, kicking around 380, 385. Uh, that's a valuable asset. And if people aren't paying attention to on base percentage and you are, you've just identified a market inefficiency. It's, it's analytics and it's sabermetrics, but it's also a, a mindset of like, where can we find value that other people aren't finding? And part of it is, you know, if you're a small market club, you can't afford to compete financially with the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Dodgers and, and, and a few others. You know, you've got these front offices and you're, you know, imagine you're a general manager and your boss is like, that's it. 80, you know, we're not going over a hundred million dollars in payroll this year. And you're like, okay, well, you know, we've locked up a couple of our key guys to long-term deals, and that's now representing 35 or 40 percent of our expected payroll. I've got to fill out, you know, I'm going to fill out a 40-man roster uh, and not go over, you know, this payroll that I've that a payroll cap that I've been given by my by my ownership. And so you, you it forces you to to try and hunt for value and and try and find those market inefficiencies that perhaps other clubs aren't paying attention to, so that you can maximize your results on the field. Bean's tactics and strategy inspired Michael Lewis to publish Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game in 2003. In the book, Lewis describes Billy Bean's ideal list of 20 players. Ideal in that if the A's were not worried about either money or opposing teams drafting, they would pick these 20 players. One of these players is a second baseman out of Florida. Mark Kiger is considered by Billy Bean to be one of the 20 best players available in the country. Bean has a smaller list, a must-have list of sorts. It contains eight players that Bean wants on his team more than anyone else. Mark Kiger is one of the eight players. Here's what the book has to say on him. Just talk to Kiger, the fat scout says laconically. Mark Kiger plays shortstop for the University of Florida, a machine for wearing down opposing pitchers and getting himself on base. Too small to play pro ball, or so they said. Now, a fifth-round draft choice of the Oakland A's. What did he say? asks Billy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, says the fat scout, and then laughs. He just wanted to get drafted. It's estimated that most drafted players take about two to three years before they debut, and even then, that's only the 15% of players that make it to the bigs. So, realistically, Kiger has until about 2005 to get called up. Mark will spend 2002 with the Vancouver Canadians, the low A affiliate of the A's. He performs well enough to be promoted to the Modesto A's in high A ball in 2003. By 2004, Kiger was progressing rapidly. He made double A with the Midland Rockhounds and even made a handful of games in triple A. In 2005, Kiger was back in double A for the majority of the season, and now here's 2006. In all likelihood, if Mark Kiger wants to make the major leagues, he likely has until the end of the season to do it. Mark makes the AAA team for 61 games. He plays well, but he is not called up by the end of the minor league season. Statistically speaking, Mark Kiger will likely never make the major leagues. Mark Kiger has just made his major league debut. The thing about the 2006 A's is that the middle infield defensively was a mess. Defensive run saves is a number that basically says, here's one number, that's how good a defender a certain player is. The above average just means zero is average, higher is better, lower is worse. 
None of the A's shortstops had a positive number, and only one second baseman had a positive number. You had Mark Ellis, who was a Gold Glove finalist, but he got hurt in the ALDS. The 2004 AL Rookie of the Year, Bobby Crosby, was on the DL at the end of the year, and the same with Antonio Perez. So going into the postseason, the A's needed another second baseman, and preferably one with good defense. They looked at the minors and saw a good enough infielder sitting in AAA, so the Athletics called him up to the postseason roster. In Game 3 of the 2006 ALCS, in the bottom of the 8th, he came in as a defensive replacement for Bobby Keatley, who was brought in as a pinch hitter. Wearing number 8, he became the first player since Bug Holiday in 1885 to make his Major League debut in the postseason. The first action of the inning was a fly out to right. If you follow him, you can watch him trail after it before looping away. But he would get some action. Later in the inning, a grounder was hit to the shortstop, Marco Scutaro, who flipped it over to Kiger. That was it for Kiger's time in Game 3, but Come Game 4, the same thing happened. Keatley pinch hit for D'Angelo Jimenez, and Kiger came in as a defensive substitute. After two consecutive flyouts over his head, a single into center goes up the middle, but it's more on the shortstop side. Then another ball hit over his head. He doesn't even get to catch the relay throw. A mound visit is called. Kiger doesn't come in. Mark came in as a defensive replacement for the ninth hitting batter, meaning if he is going to get a plate appearance, then this game must go at least another inning. But the game does not continue. The worst part about giving up a walk-off is walking back to the dugout. Naturally, since he was playing second, he was going to have to pass Maglio at some point. That's how Mark Kiger's career went. Never the center of history, but more often the margins of history. While he rounds first, you can see Kiger's immediate reaction in the background. Completely defeated. You can see the same reaction in the unforgettable shot of Placido Polanco leaping around the bases. He passes Maglio as he nears second. Kiger walks slowly back to the dugout. I think he might have known it at the time, but Mark Kiger will never play in the major leagues again. Mark Kiger was released by the A's on December 6, 2006. He was signed by the Mets a month later and played for the Binghampton Mets in AA for the majority of 2007. His minor league all-star selection was worthy of a promotion to AAA, but he performed poorly once being assigned to the New Orleans Zephyrs. At the year's end, he was granted free agency. He signed with the Seattle Mariners organization and would spend 2008 in AA with the West Tennessee Diamond Jacks. He again was granted free agency and he again signed with the Mets. His 2009 started in rookie ball, the lowest level of the minors, with the Gulf Coast Mets. He would be promoted to the Binghamton Mets again, for two games, he would play in AAA with the Buffalo Bisons. He did not record a hit, walk, or RBI. Mark Kiger would retire following the 2009 season. His career was ultimately a disappointment, but if you stand far back enough, he was still a part of history. He's still special. There have been almost 20,000 players in MLB history. The vast majority of minor league players, around 90%, never make the majors. Even fewer make the postseason. Since his retirement, four players have debuted in the postseason. But out of every player in MLB history, only one has ever played his entire career in the postseason. He is without peer. He is unique. He is one of one. He is Mark Kiger.